Thank you. Um, I think that also got our blood going and it got us talking to each other. And if we're talking about caring, we need to acknowledge that each other exists. Are there any students there? Oh, no, not are there any students. Where are the students? Can I see you by a raising of hands? It's very difficult to see from here. Okay, great. Wonderful. The reason I want to know where you are is you must listen carefully because I want to hear your voice at the end of the session because they're going to be talking about student support and assessment and it would be really nice to hear the student's voice um, in, the, in the question and response time. The, um, I was very lucky last week to go to a leadership um, conference and there was a speaker there called Sam Adiemi who's Nigerian and he said the following that struck me um, and I think it, it resonates with what the last person said as well. Um, and, it, it, and he was talking about the fact that um, if education only deals with the mind, we haven't got the point. Um, and he said the following, and I sort of, I took it down while I was writing, so I might, I, it's sort of a bit of paraphrase, so don't take it as an exact quote. Real substantial change starts with a change of identity. What we believe is what we become and where we belong. Changing how people see themselves is the heart of education. If education is going to be transformative, students need to believe that is where they belong and change comes from the inside out. So I think that, that if we're talking about student support, that might be quite interesting. Um, right, we, uh, we've got our first, um, we're going to have, um, um, uh, Zingiza Unkozinkulu, who's going to, is our graphic, um, is, she's a doctoral student in visual arts and she's going to continue with the live graffiti over there. So um, um, that should be interesting. Our next speaker is Miss Lee Stone from the College of Law. Um, she's a lecturer in the Department of Public, Constitutional, International Law. Um, she's also an, an extraordinary lecturer at St. Augustine University in Tanzania. Lee is an attorney of the High Court of South Africa and the chairperson of the Board of Directors of Agenda, a feminist non-governmental organization. She has previously worked for the African Commission on Humans and People's Rights and the Institution, Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa in the Gambia. She has published widely in the area of international criminal law, the African regional human rights system, refugee law, gender and the law, and constitutional law. I'd like her to come to the podium. Thank you. Uh, so my presentation is essentially titled The Personal is Political and hopefully that will, well, the relevance of that will be revealed soon enough. So the context then for this presentation is the... How do so we do this? <laughs> is, okay, yeah, that's good. It's very sensitive, so it might just go too fast. Okay, so the context then is for some time now, but particularly in 2012, the judiciary and the person in particular was the Chief Justice at the time, he said that law graduates from throughout South Africa, not specific universities, are out of their depth and they lack communication skills. So bearing that in mind, in 2013, UNISA adopted a teaching charter, and the teaching charter dictates that all reasonable assistance must be provided to our students in order that they can succeed. So confirming the fact that we need to support our students as far as possible, and bearing in mind that they are struggling. The 2014 white paper on higher education, or post-school education as it's termed, states that learners that are emerging from basic education are insufficiently prepared for further study, which is exhibited through a veritable lack of adequate reading, writing, and comprehension skills. On page six of the book, Post-Colonialism, Robert Young says, when people are faced with the authority of theory produced by academics, people assume that their own difficulties of comprehension arise from a deficiency in themselves. So this is what motivates me then. 
To my mind, the incomprehension that our students suffer from is due precisely to colonialization. The South African education system, as we know, reproduces and perpetuates a Western or Eurocentric dominant philosophy. Therefore, it's not surprising that our students do struggle to comprehend the material that they're confronted with, and they therefore suffer feelings of inadequacy and deficiency. So my approach then is to try to mitigate these feelings of inadequacy or deficiency. And the way I do this is by being cognizant of the policy objectives of the Department of Higher Education in South Africa, which includes making sure that we have an expanded access to education and improved quality of education. And I read this in conjunction with the second policy objectives, which is that we need to create a system of education that is responsive to the needs of individual citizens, in other words, our students, as well as to the prospective employers, both in public and private sector, that our students are going to be approaching to one day be employed there. And not only do we then have to look at the individuals involved, but we have to look at the broader societal and developmental objectives of South Africa, which of course include the need to build a fair, equitable, non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous and fully functioning democracy. So that's why I termed my paper today, The Personal is Political. Because if we support our students effectively, we will do this by a positive intervention. So the way I do it is to create alternative knowledge systems, hoping that these alternative knowledge systems will resonate with the inextricable link between identity, the person, and the political climate within which we operate. So the personal is indeed political. So the empirical advice or evidence that I keep in mind when I'm approaching the teaching of the courses I do and how I'm going to support my students is the fact that I have to take into account that according to the white paper, close to three-fifths of South Africa's university students are distance education students. Secondly, that the average age of UNISA students varies quite dramatically, but in my context where I teach a second year course, a minimum of 20% of the students that I'm teaching are younger than 24. And that's quite important if you consider that I teach constitutional law, for which you need to have a certain amount of political maturity to fully comprehend and absorb and understand. Another problem, and this is the problem that's been highlighted in the 2011 National Development Plan, is that the higher education system is characterized by low participation and high attrition. So to prove that, the statistics at UNISA indicate that for the LLB degree, at least 65% of the students only just manage to pass from their first year into their second year within one year. 35% just cannot do that, and that's not good enough. And then, of course, I wanted to just quote one of my students recently who said, I have seven distinctions out of the nine modules I've taken, and yet this particular course that you are teaching me is overwhelming, complex, bewildering, I don't think I'm going to be able to pass. So that's why I then have a plan and how I execute the mandate of providing adequate student support is as follows. Since it is the national development plan itself, which is prospective looking, which emphasizes South Africa's emerging identity, ethics, morality, indigenous knowledge systems, 
and the struggle for liberation in South Africa and the Constitution itself, I use that as my guiding path for teaching constitutional law to second year LLB students, of which I have between 2,500 and 3,000 per semester in my class. And the reason why I've internalized the National Development Plan's objectives is precisely because I am mindful of the contribution of indigenous knowledge systems to theories of the self, so self-determination, to education, and to survival, all of which are absolutely fundamental if we are going to eradicate the grip of colonization. Therefore, my intention when teaching constitutional law is to inculcate a culture of thinking citizens who can function effectively, ethically, creatively as part of a democratic South Africa and my students must have an understanding of their society and they must be able to participate meaningfully and fully in its political, social, and cultural life. And of course, constitutional law being as dynamic as it is, lends itself very well to this plan. And I, of course, I have the benefit then of being able to draw on the history of South Africa to progress in terms of moving the students forward in a more fundamental sense. So this is what I mean by that, is my philosophy to, to student support and to teaching is to change the way our students think. So I believe that if I can change the way the students think and the way they behave, in turn, a political shift should take place. This political shift would carry with it personal ownership of the process and the outcome, and inevitably, therefore, because it's a personal process that the students have gone through, there will be ownership of it that is legitimate, credible, equitable, just, and therefore satisfactory precisely because I am trying to affirm the identity and the self-worth of our students. So that's why I expend the amount of hours I do in a day to student support, because I am so committed to providing adequate, optimal learning for our students who are so desperately in need of more assistance than students perhaps at residential universities and therefore, I try to give them a broad framework, but at the same time, remaining truthful and accurate to the law, but giving them the opportunity to actually create these alternative epistemologies. And I can obviously draw on the South African Constitution, which has within it autochthonous or indigenous concepts, even at though they may not be expressly written, but Ubuntu is one of my starting points. So the way I use Ubuntu is as follows, is that I give the students in their, in their study guide and often in, a, in an assignment and even in an exam, questions sort of as I've got on the, on the page there, where I would say to them, something along the lines of write an essay where you highlight the comparisons between the objectives of constitutional law and Ubuntu. And you must do this by using relevant authority, meaning case law or provisions of the constitution, using fundamental principles or concepts that you've now learnt in constitutional law and you must reach a legally sound, compelling, persuasive conclusion. So there, there isn't any information that would tell them exactly how to answer the question. So I do expect them to go and read up themselves on what Ubuntu actually is and be able to draw those links by themselves. 
So the very founding values of Ubuntu include things such as compassion, care, democracy. And I believe, therefore, that if I encourage the students to look wider than just the narrow interpretations of democracy, for example, or compassion, they will be able to draw those fundamental links. One of the more straightforward examples would be that if Ubuntu means that everyone counts in society, then that di relates directly with the idea that we must have a participatory democracy. We all have a right to be involved and have our say. So then, finally, um, the idea is that if I engage with the students consistently, so every single day I go onto my UNISA and I engage in discussion with the students, I also make sure that I have video conference discussion classes with the students where I give them this platform to create knowledge about what constitutional law actually is and what it actually means by relying on, on indigenous concepts. What I'm hoping to instill is that the students will develop their critical thinking processes, which is in itself an essential element of being a good lawyer. And of course, the message in there is that I try and tell the students, if we are in a society with scarce resources, Ubuntu indicates that Ubuntu is there to make sure that everyone benefits in a society of scarce resources. So, because there is this scarcity of resources, and here I use the term resources very widely, it could include democracy itself or accountability. If there's the scarcity, then our students must realize that they are likely to suffer prejudice if the scarcity of accountability is not dealt with. And that's why I try and teach the students that in every single thing they do, they must be aware that there is the law, and they must follow the law, and they must ensure that other people follow the law likewise, so that we all can live happy, prosperous lives in this democracy. And I use concepts like colonization to that end. I'm wanting to awaken the students' emotional intelligence about the path that South Africa has taken from apartheid and how we need to ensure that we don't have a reseating of colonization. So state capture, I say to the students, that's a form of colonization. And that then resonates with the students. I also am not afraid, for example, to confront issues of land and identity because I know of the close link between the two. And therefore, finally, I believe that my approach works because of the feedback I receive from my students where they say to me that my engagement with them, where I give them this forum to actually create constitutional law for themselves and be able to explain it, gives them a feeling of recognition that someone cares. The word care is very important there. And that they really realize that someone is interested in their academic well-being and that they recognize that the subject is taught in a way that makes it topical, relevant, and most importantly, alive. And that is my objective. And then finally, you'll see in that quote where the student said, Excellence creates hope. That single phrase is something that I now virtually live by. The concept of excellence creating hope is so true. So I am therefore committed to excellent student support and tuition. And the, the last quote was from a student who wrote an exam who had asked about Ubuntu. And he came away from the exam saying that it was the best exam he'd ever written, which sounds quite strange, but he said it was just overwhelming to him how he was given an opportunity to talk about constitutional law in our democratic state using 
new constitutional models that actually fit South Africa. So that's my message is we, if we teach in a way that has an objective and we align ourselves with the constitution and we do our best to make sure that the students are engaged, they are going to succeed. And succeed doesn't necessarily mean they get a distinction, but they are part of this political climate and political community. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lee. I'm glad that um, um, the agriculture students are, aren't the only students that people moan about. Um, agriculture is forever hearing that our students aren't prepared for work. Um, and I sometimes often wonder whether people understand what the purpose of education is. But anyway, um, that's another discussion. Um, but thank you very much for that interesting talk. Our next um, um, speaker is two people. Um, it's Mr. Neil Cochran and Mr. Neil van Heerden. Um, and um, Neil number one, which is Neil van Heerden, uh, has a degree in publishing from the University of Pretoria. He's got a BA honors in Afrikaans. Um, he did his, um, um, and I love this, his master's degree focused on South African crime fiction, specifically novels by Dion Mayer, and how they relate to the literary canon. Um, his other research includes popular fiction, narratology, criticism, post-colonialism, or decoloniality. He's currently a junior lecturer in the Department of Afrikaans Theory. Um, I'm shortening your bios because of time. And then um, Neil Cochran, or Neil number two, he's also got a, um, a degree from publishing studies in, in Afrikaans literature at the University of Victoria. He's lectured at the University of Victoria and now at UNISA, as well as the Adam, and I wasn't quite sure how to pronounce this, Mickey Kweitz University in Plzen in Poland. He contributes to various academic publi uh, publications like Tate Script for Letterkunde, Stilet Literature, Acta Academia, and Litnet Academies. He's an active review of Afrikaans literature for the Afrikaans Press and academic journals. And I think that, um, and he's also completed the e EU, the, sorry, the U University of Maryland College, uh, University College Graduate Certificate in Education Technology and E-Learning, and he's also a lecturer in the Department of Afrikaans and Theory of Literature. Welcome. Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so my name is Neil van Jerden, or Neil One, and my colleague is Neil Cochran, and that's not a typo. We really are both Neil, and uh, hence some of our colleagues in the department jokingly refer to us as Neil Squared. Right, so uh, we've been nominated in the category Student Support, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to share with you some of our thoughts and practices. The well-known poet, let me just check if this works. Right, so the well-known poet, Charles Bukowski, is purported to have said, you begin saving the world by saving one man at a time. All else is grandiose romanticism or politics. Well, today I want to plagiarize Mr. Bukowski's words, you know, as it were, and say that at UNISA, we begin saving the world one student at a time. This is really part and parcel of our philosophy and practice in the module AFK 2601. Let me unpack that a little bit. So AFK 2601 is an Afrikaans literature module at second year level, uh, titled Genre and Theme. Uh, we have roughly 1,000 students per semester, um, and the number of registrations just keep rising every year. From a broad range of backgrounds, many of whom are B.Ed. students electing to do Afrikaans as their compulsory, one of their compulsory language modules. Now, perhaps, you can imagine uh, what a challenge it is to teach literature in a day and age where books seem to take a backseat to more visually interesting media like Facebook and YouTube, let alone ignite some enthusiasm for reading. But as indicated in this graphic, all right, there we go. There's the first technical glitch, I apologize. That's what I want to show you. 
In this graphic, you can see the significant increase in, in the overall pass rate for AFK2601. It's an increase of between 12 and 13 percent, which goes to show that students aren't just doing the bare minimum. It would appear that they're actually excelling. Now, we believe this has a lot to do not only with good solid content and the new blended learning approach we adopted as of 2016, but also with good student support. In this short presentation, I want to highlight just some of the practical ways Neil and I have tried to walk the extra mile in support of our students. So this paper will be less theoretical or philosophical, if you were, and more focused on the practical. Um, I've also put in a little disclaimer. Uh, we have a really bulky file that we submitted as our portfolio of evidence. It's really hard to summarize that. Uh, so if you were to flip through that portfolio of evidence, that would be like watching the full 90 minute game. This is just the highlights reel, if you will. Right, so getting down to brass tacks, we can first of all point to a number of ways we've expanded our administrative support. We rely heavily on MyUNISA discussion forums uh, to handle both academic and administrative queries. However, we found that the general discussion forum can become quite cluttered and chaotic. That is why we've created a super logical and demarcated structure with specific forums and subtopics for each of the six learning units, uh, administrative queries, technical queries, and academic queries. This way students can more easily navigate and post their question or comment in the most relevant space. This also actually helps us to, to handle these queries much more efficiently. Uh, we structured our additional resources in the same logical manner, including three user-friendly documents, namely a welcoming letter, getting to know your online environment, and frequently asked questions. Now, in the first semester of 2016, uh, we experienced a number of uh, logistical issues with the delivery of study material, which was further compounded by late registrations and uh, some intermittent problems with access to MyUNISA. Now, for a period, many students had literally no access to the study material whatsoever. And inevitably, we were uh, swamped with a barrage of emails and phone calls from panicked students, right? But instead of sitting Heinkies uh, Gefo, as they say in Afrikaans, we tried to make the best of the situation and managed it in a proactive manner. We immediately sent the study material to those students who contacted us directly. We published the six learning units as separate PDFs under additional resources so that students could access it in a more sort of, or in smaller chunks, if you will. We regularly followed up with printing and dispatch. I think we actually irritated them. Uh, but we followed up with them regularly to try and monitor the situation. We kept students informed by sending out numerous SMS messages, uh, and we also wrote a memo requesting automatic exam admissions, because after all, uh, it's imperative for us that students get the fairest possible opportunity to pass the module successfully, especially because um, logistical issues like this are not their fault. Now I'd like to just highlight one particular technical support intervention. Many of our students had immense difficulty with accessing the e-reserves last year. They either in encountered a, a technical glitch, a so-called 404 or data not found error, or they battled with the navigation path via the library website. Now this is not merely a nuisance because AFK 2601 students actually need the poems, short stories and articles to do their assignments. So we did the following. We created a specific forum for technical queries on MyUNISA, as I've mentioned. We posted meticulous announcements outli outlining how to get the e-reserves. We published a comprehensive troubleshooting document under additional resources. We provided step-by-step -step instructions on how to clear your web browser's cache memory, uh, including some hints and tips on how to be web savvy. We even scheduled a meeting with Ms. Chantal van der Merwe, who is the librarian responsible for e-reserves. And we raised the issue at school tuition committee level, all in a bid to try and solve the e-reserves problem going forward. And that has proven uh, quite successful. 
This brings me to another old foe that uh, we lecturers in the trenches know all too well, and that is faulty and late submissions. Now, despite thorough guidelines in our 101 on how to properly submit an assignment via MyUNISA, we still find that many students often attach incorrect documents or versions. They submit their assignments under the wrong module code or get confused between assignment one and two, because in our case, it's, you know, both are written assignments. Uh, and sometimes they also submit so-called corrupted files, which, of course, you know, we are unable to open for marking. Now, of course, human errors do occur, but the last thing we want is to penalize students for something as silly as a faulty submission, right? So we really go to great lengths to try and assist in these cases. We look up the student's contact details on the student system. We then phone them directly, sometimes you know, only getting through on the second or third try, or first having to speak to a, a mother or an aunt or a brother. Uh, and explain to them that they please need to send us the correct assignment via email. Now, at this point, students are usually very apologetic and extremely grateful. Once we receive the correct assignment, we do a replacement on the J router and then mark it as per usual. We're also very accommodating when it comes to late submissions due to you know, sickness or personal misfortune. In these cases, we accept the assignment via email because often the online submissions are already closed by then. We print and mark the assignment. We then ask someone at the assignment section to capture the mark per hand or by hand. And finally, we scan and email the, the marked assignment back to the student with <coughs> comprehensive feedback. Now, we follow the same procedure with the exam portfolios, by the way. Now, considering we are two lecturers uh, managing AFK 2601, we really do feel that this kind of intervention is quite exceptional. The next point is an important one and relates to the support we give to students who qualify for a supplementary exam. Now, worried that these students are or may feel that they are left to their own devices and often in the dark as to what is expected of them, we do the following. Um, at the end of each semester, we scour the XMO report uh, to identify our supplementary uh, students using a good old fashioned highlighter and ruler. Uh, we then send out a bulk SMS requesting all supplementary students to contact us directly via email. By the way, I think um, we probably uh, use the SMS service more than, more than most, but it works. Uh, once they do contact us, we then give them a document with very clear instructions. They're expected to submit an improved version of their original exam portfolio. This entails that we give them their original marked portfolio with additional com comments uh, on how they can improve it. And finally, they're invited to send us or one of the e-tutors, if they feel more comfortable with them, uh, their uh, attempt before submitting their final version. Now, as you can imagine, very few students who are empowered in this way uh, actually fail the module, thereby improving the throughput rate drastically. Uh, we follow more or less the same route with our FI concessions. Moving on. <laughs> I apologize, ladies and gents. There we go. Right, moving on to more academic or discipline-specific support. Uh, when students come to us with questions uh, about the work itself, we tend to get rather excited, um, you know, hashtag nerd alert, because we actually see this as an opportunity to really engage and teach. We are academics, after all. So we therefore, we don't believe in giving cryptic short answers, or so-called one-liners. We try and provide substantial, constructive feedback Happily explaining things in English, uh, if that happens to be the language uh, of preference. We encourage our tutors and external markers to do the same. In addition to detailed, okay, to detailed assessment rubrics, <laughs> in, ad in addition to detailed assessment rubrics, explaining. Um, you know, helping students to know exactly what is expected of them. Uh, we also give students extra guidelines um, on how to tackle difficult assignment questions. 
We wrote our own guide on how to write a literary essay and put that in the 201 letter. Um, we also provided students with relevant information on correct referencing uh, and how to avoid plagiarism. We even made use of the glossary function on Mayunisa. Um, well, to try and explain literary terms and concepts in a more student-friendly, uh, accessible manner. Right. In short, we really try and give our students all the tools they need to be successful in this module. In terms of emotional support, which is the next little subsection, we try our level best to uh, put students at ease and break down the barriers and feelings of isolation often associated with distance learning. Right. In particular, we do so through our user-friendly welcome message, which you can see on screen, as well as an introductory discussion forum on my UNISA called Leer Ken Mekor, uh, where students can introduce themselves, chat with us and one another, and form study groups. Uh, incidentally, this uh, particular forum seems to be one of the most popular, um, suggesting that students really do yearn for uh, um, some more informal contact. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we are always um, sympathetic. Oh, almost forgot about that one. We also compiled a set of so-called house rules for behaving in a friendly, respectful manner online and posted that as an announcement. This way everyone could rest assured that uh, AFK 2601 is a safe space. <coughs> now, as mentioned earlier, we are also very accommodating when it comes to personal misfortune. Um, in 2016, for instance, uh, we went to a great deal of trouble to request a special oral examination for a supplementary student who was unable to write her written exam. I won't mention their names out of respect for their privacy, but in our portfolio of evidence, we also make reference to students who suffered from illness and severe anxiety, um, and of course, these students were consoled and given extensions. These are just a couple of examples, but I think you get the point. Now, External markers and e-tutors are another integral part of AFK 2601's success. We support our support staff, who in turn support our students, um, by having an open door policy, by giving them user-friendly comprehensive memoranda, uh, which may be followed up by face-to-face -face marking meetings. At the end of each semester, we formally thank and congratulate our e-tutors and external markers, informing them of the final results and pass rates for the module. We think this is an important way to keep everyone motivated and on board um, and to maintain a good working relationship with our support staff. How did we manage to inspire or motivate our students to become independent scholars? Okay. Um, I apologize. A few things stand out. Right. Firstly, we sent a congratulations letter to all our students who obtained a final mark of 90% or higher, encouraging them to continue with the subject at third year level. Um, now, I just want to mention that we would love to do this for all distinction uh, students, but of course, there were just too many. Uh, so we focused on, 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 on the really, really great achievements there. But thanks to the letter, we even had a number of B.Ed. students inquire about registering for an honors degree in Afrikaans to improve their career prospects. It may seem like a small gesture, but with this letter, we wanted to applaud our students' achievements, just as these awards are a way of uh, acknowledging hard work at UNISA. Secondly, we introduced blogs as part of our assessment strategy in 2016. So I had to post 10 online blog entries throughout the semester, which then ultimately uh, were included in the exam portfolio. This is not only in line with ODEL pedagogy, uh, it also encourages students to share their ideas openly and independently. Thirdly, as I've mentioned before, we refuse to spoon feed our students. Um, so. We don't give model answers that they simply have to regurgitate like parrots. Uh, rather, we gently nudge them uh, to make their own discoveries you know, by using open-ended questions and prompts. Okay. Finally, we maintain a 
zero tolerance uh, policy towards plagiarism um, and we provide good guidance on how to avoid that. Uh, we have a, a great in-house manual on the Harvard referencing method um, which we give to students and would be more than happy to share with anyone who's interested. To further demonstrate how we cultivated uh, independent scholarship, I can perhaps uh, just mention the case of Mr. Second Chances. Um, obviously, that's not his real name. I just, <laughs> I just made that up to protect his privacy. But Mr. Second Chances was one of our supplementary students. Um, he was really, really battling to produce a satisfactory essay. Um, now, in order to help him through, my colleague Neil uh, perused his original attempt and wrote a long list of comments using track changes. These comments then enabled Mr. Second Chances to you know, critically reflect and uh, improve on his original uh, version. The final version was such an improved essay that he walked away with, uh, you know, not a distinction, but, but very close to it. Um, and this, this one case just goes to show what can be done if you start saving, you, you know, you need so one student at a time. Okay, that brings me to the end of my talk, or uh, very nearly the end. Uh, and I hope in this brief presentation, I gave you just a little bit of a glimpse um, of how Neil and I have strived to, you know, uh, support our students one at a time, and will continue to do so, I can assure you that. In conclusion, um, I can perhaps point to what is perhaps the most powerful barometer of sustained, continuous, and broad student support, namely the thank yous and compliments. Now, there are many, but here's just one such a compliment uh, that makes all the hard work worthwhile for us. I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, uh, as a third year student, I've completed many UNISA modules, but AFK 2601 stands out for a number of reasons as one of the best. What struck me most about AFK 2601 was the thorough, extensive, and timely support that characterized the module. And that's just freely translated. Uh, colleagues, I want to thank you for your valuable time. Um, also, I'd like to just mention, anyone who's interested, please give me a shout, and I would be happy to share this presentation with you along with our assessment rubrics, our Harvard referencing uh, you know, manual, guidelines for writing essays, etc. After all, we are here to support one another as well, not just the students, and uh, we would love to have some open dialogue on that. Again, thank you for your valuable time. Thank you, Neil and Neil. I think um, your generosity is, is, is evidenced in your offer to support other lecturers, but is also evidenced in how you support your students. Um, but both of you giving your extra time to students and really um, going the extra mile. And I, I found that really interesting, so thank you. Um, this session is student support and assessment. And of the five, there is one assessment um, presentation, and that's Ms. Um, Delius van Heerden. She's a lecturer at the School of Computing, um, and she's been teaching programming modules um, for quite a few years. Her main research interests include e-learning, m-learning, and technology-enhanced learning, and she's currently busy with her master's degree in technology education. Morning, everyone. Just quickly, I am the lecturer for three first-year models, all based in programming languages. Um, ICT 1511, there is approximately 250 students per semester. ICT 1512, uh, 350, and ICT 1513, about 400 students per semester. Just to put some context into what I'm doing. If assessment within an institution for the institution is to get proof of life or to give a student exam admission. If assessment for a student is to get exam admission or just purely to get a degree or a paper at the end of the day. And if assessment for academics is because the institution says we are doing it wrong. Assessment is, should be 
part of the learning process. It shouldn't be something that is standing aside on the sidelines and we just doing it because we as academics are told to do it and the students are doing it to get exam admissions. And the university requires assessments so they can get money from the Department of Higher Education. There's a lot more to assessment than just answering questions. When teaching programming, one would think that a programming student needs to be able to write a program. Then he should be able to pass the module. Unfortunately, that is not correct because they need to know the theory behind the practical to understand what they are doing. So theory also forms part of the entire assessment process. Language. IT language. A lot of our students think that me, just studying the theory or just studying the practical, what they don't realize is that as IT people, they will be required to communicate with users. They will have to write um, reports. They need to be able to write user manuals. So they need to be able to communicate in the language of the programming um, environment or of the IT environment. And then, of course, practical. If you are studying programming and you cannot write a program, well, why bother? <laughs> so how do I assess these three components of the IT students? For the theory, I have created databases of um, questions on my UNISA for each of the modules, each of the chapters. They have self-assessments, which they can do as often as they like. Um, and they are, if you know this is the, the self-assessment, as soon as they submit that, they get their responses. What they do not like is the fact that I do not give them the answer. I, at the beginning of the semester, I always get a lot of, what is this REF 156 thing? And then I say, reference page 156 in your book. They physically have to go back to their books and read up to get the correct answer. It's not just provided. Um, this is also part of the formal formative assessments. For ICT 1511, they have nine assignments in a semester. 1512 have seven assignments, and 1513 has nine assignments. So they have to submit for they have to submit four self-assessment assignments that is based on the same set of questions that's in the, um, that they get in the self-assessment. The language part. Now, this is where the students really do not like it. I require my IT students to blog about what they've studied. So they have to sit back, think about what they've studied, and explain that to me in order to help them build that language basis that they need. In the beginning of the semester, I get a lot of summaries. They go and they summarize the book, and then I say, sorry, nice try, but go back. I need your thoughts, your interpretations. How did it affect you? How did you do it? What was your reaction about it? I don't want a summary of what's stated in the book. The practical is based on a real life scenario. The students, every, sem okay, every year, not every semester, but every year I change this assignment. They either have to contact a school in their area or a small business in their area 
or their employer and create a specific website for those, for the places that they contacted. What is important about this assignment is that it gives them that interaction with the user. And what I also tell the students is, save these assignments, your practical assignments. Because when you go for a job interview or you go for a raise, you have proof of ability. These days, when you apply for a position, it's really that they, they get a lot of CD, CVs, millions of CVs. They all look the same. They all have, I got so much for these modules. But if you can include proof of ability, your CV stands out. I am able to. So when doing this assignment, they show they are able to. They have proof of ability. Um, the summative assessments, the theory, the same database of questions used for the self-assessment and the um, other assi the self-assessment assignment is used in the exam papers. The language, they get short answer questions where they have to explain a certain concept. And for the practical, it's similar to the practical assignments that they have to do. Now, you can understand that we cannot have computers at every exam center without, across the country and across the world. So we, we give them certain pieces of code with errors in that they have to identify and or they have to design the logic for an, um, a question or they have to build a cascading style sheet. That type of questions are in their formative assessments. The summative assessments. What's interesting, the uptake of the self-assessment. So these are the ones they can do as often as they, they want to. Are very low. It's below 50% of the students actually make use of the self-assessment. They, despite the fact that I tell them that this will help you prepare for your assignments, it will help you prepare for your examinations, they don't make use of it. The uptake of the theory assessments, so the, similar to the self-assessment, you can see the, what's interesting about it is that um, as the semester goes along, less and less students submit their assignments. Now, one of the reasons we attribute this to is the fact that UNISA only, or the majority of the other, the other uh, modules that they do, only require one or two assignments, and UNISA only requires one assignment for exam um, admission. So the feeling is they and then, of course, the workload. Because as they progress through the semester, they start realizing doing five IT modules in one semester is just, their workload is beyond, they don't have the time. The uptake of the language assessment. This is really, the students do not like blogging when they start at the beginning of the semester. It also tends to go down as the semester progresses, but I have to say a lot of the students at the end of the semester will come back and say, now I understand the purpose of this assignment. I can see the value of it. And what has happened is that some of the second year lecturers have come to me, they don't have the blog available on their sites, so the students started blogging on their discussion forum. No, just one, just one. Okay, the practical assignments. This is where they have to show the ability. The students don't submit their practical assignments. And for what, some reason, they do rather well in the theory, they don't do that well in the blogs, and then they don't submit the practical, where I have to show my ability. 
So uptake year is very low for, th for all three of the, of the modules. The support that are given to these students, for their practical assignments, I, um, for their practical parts that they have to do, I've created videos, which vodcast, which is available in the learning units of the modules, where I literally go through the code that's in their prescribed books, and as I do the code, I explain what I'm doing, and the students can watch those. There's additional resources, links to anything, anywhere in the world that's related to their work. They get weekly announcements to tell them what they have to do during that week, reminders when assignments are due. SMSs, um, I think I am also one of those people who absolutely overuse the SMS system because I check after the due date of every assignment, I go through the list and I send those students who have not yet submitted an SMS to say, your assignment is still outstanding, please submit before this date. Now keep in mind, three modules, nine, seven, nine assignments, of which those of you who have used the blog tool should know the absolute frustration and irritation it's on the lecture assignment. And then I also have online meetings. Um, I use the uh, meeting tool on my UNISA. I love the tool. I'm a professor of the tool. Um, if you haven't used it, try it. It's a lovely tool. Um, I have one, three sessions for each module before the um, practical assignment is due. So one in, during the day in the week, one during the evening in the week, and one on a Saturday for all three of the modules so that I can answer questions about what is expected of the, assi the assignment. I do the same for the examination. I'm currently in the process of doing my ones for this upcoming examination. What is disheartening is that attendance by the students is less than 10%. And these are IT students. And I hound them. They get SMS reminders when it is scheduled. They get SMS reminders just before we start. They get, but still they, they're not there. Ah. There you go. Okay, as you can see, all three of my modules are at-risk modules. Despite everything, they are at-risk modules. The students struggle to pass the programming modules. And that is what my master's degree is based on is, I've given you everything, why aren't you using it? And my conclusions. When you evaluate the a specific tool that you are using, the student's final results is not indicative of whether this tool works or not. Then the best laid plans of mice and men more often go awry. So with everything that I've put on my UNISA, I can keep you here, those of you who know me, for the entire day, telling you what I do on my UNISA to support, to assess, to assist, to be there, to carry the students, to assist the students. If the student does not come to the party, there's nothing I can do about it. Then, if I don't get the support from the, um, the university, it is also a big problem. If systems are down, if all those changes in due dates, in registration dates, all of those negatively affect the student and in turn the lecturer, especially considering that there's nine assignments which is used for learning, not for assessing. They're there for learning. So with all those things, it just creates chaos. And that's it.
Thank you so much, Delise. Um, I'm reading a book, and I've just suddenly forgotten the author. It's called Grit, and it's where, um, and it's passion and perseverance will help you have success. So I'm sure you've got the passion, and you seem to have the perseverance to keep on doing it. So hopefully, um, you will succeed eventually. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to have one more speaker before lunch, and then we're going to break for lunch after that speaker. And I'd like to invite um, Professor Ramarola to the, um, from the College of Education to the podium. Um, she's a lecturer in the field of computer integrated education, or well, she was one, but she's currently at the Center for Professional Development on secondment. On secondment. She has the following qualifications, a university diploma in education from a from um, a College of Education, a BA degree from UNISA, a B.Ed. from UP, a B.Maz honors from UP, an M.Ed. in Computer Integrated Education from UP, a D.Ed. on Computer Integrated um, Education from UNISA, a certificate in e-learning um, from the University of Maryland, and she's finalizing a second M. degree, an M.Ed. in ODL with UNISA. She's published um, quite widely as well. So. Um, very much welcome to the podium. Good afternoon, colleagues. Yes, uh, I'm wearing two caps here from the College of Education and the CPD. Uh, my presentation is about uh, student support. Uh, we, as distance learning institution, we notice that there are challenges that are associated with learning in a distance. Those challenges or among such challenges have noted a sense of isolation and an experience of frustrations by student. I have realized that uh, in distance learning, our student can easily feel isolated if they are not connected to their lecturers and fellow students. One ODL theory states that a student have to be connected to, uh, to other students or fellow students, to the tutors and to the content. But if there is no support, uh, this will be useless. And this isolation may increase the dropout rate of our students. They also experience a challenge of frustration whereby as they are in, located in different uh, areas, uh, the course that is delivered at a distance, they cannot really uh, utilize and understand such courses without someone who is there to support them. And the other thing is that our students sometimes, they lack the skills as self-directed learners. They lack the skills needed to be successful in their learning. So they need the guidance, they need the support, they need the presence of the coordinator or the tutor who will support them continuously. Uh, the problem of support is not only experienced by UNISA, it is also noted by one of the famous experts in the field of international open and distance learning, Alan Tate, who once said, students want support, especially student guidance and counseling, tutor support, and effective information and administrative system, all provide a range of activity that impacts, not only in terms of teaching, but also effectively that is to say, reinforcing the student sense of confidence and self-esteem. According to Kraft, the most support service is to help the student realize the instructional objective of the course by minimizing the negative effects of isolation and the lack of regular personal contact. Given this information, it has been documented that technology, when effectively integrated, will bridge the learning distance and reduce 
the sense of isolation. My role in student support is divided into three. That is module coordination, mentorship, and student supervision. As a module coordinator, I use my UNISA tools to support our student. If you arrive in this page, you'll find that there are a lot of tools that we can utilize. For example, we have the discussion forum where we, you can uh, post some topics and engage students to share their knowledge, ask questions and other uh, related topics to the content. There are blogs wherein they can also be engaged in discussions. There are additional resources wherein most of the time I will put the tutorial letters that will support the content. For example, you give the guidelines for examinations and other related information. We also have some announcements wherein as you, you will be supporting students, you have to time and again make them aware, uh, make them aware of the due dates of the assignments. We know that students, sometimes they will send their assignments late, uh, saying that they have forgotten to send or to submit uh, according to the due date. In South Africa, we also experience a challenge of connectivity and access. So some of our students are somewhere in the rural areas, wherein they will tell you that they cannot access my UNISA. Uh, other areas also experience a problem of electricity. So we don't just leave them behind. We are to support such students using the blended mode approach. We can still reach such students by sending them the print-based materials, which will guide them to the content of the courses that they are doing. And there are also urgent matters, wherein the student will be calling you telephonically. We, we don't have to ignore them, just give them the support that will, that will, will help or assist them in whatever matter. Emails are also used and the bundle SMS messages. In terms where conveniency is appropriate, we can also arrange face-to-face -face meetings with the students to give them that uh, support. I also make sure that students are supported emotionally. For example, we assist students to lessen their, their study workload by providing them with a comprehensive work plan that will advise on time management and study skills. In this example, uh, you'll know that there is an information that is given to students which reads, it is suggested that you note down the due dates for all the assignments that you have to submit this, is this semester and compile a study plan according to these dates. You can use the following as a guideline for planning your studies for the given module. So this work plan will ease the student's workload they will be able to break down their work according to the dates, knowing that for this time I have to study this chapter or this study unit. Administratively, uh, the students are supported in their registrations. You'll find that students, time and again, they will call asking how to go on with their registrations, how to select their courses and stuff like that. And in many cases, the academic staff will say to them, I am not working at registration. So in my case, 
I will make sure that I send the particular student to the relevant department wherein he or she can be assisted. Again, uh, in MND, our students, most of the time, they struggle on how to complete the documents such as the ethical clearances and the application of bazaars. In that case, I don't just leave them. I have to make sure that I, may, I have to make sure that I support such students to complete that uh, documents. For example, at the end, oh, okay, this is an example of a clearance certificate which the student obtained after being supported in that document completion. In the module that I am teaching, there is an involvement of e-tutors. E-tutors need support so that they can support our students. So the, the, the support that I do, firstly start with the selection process. CVs are sent to my office wherein I have to make sure that I select the relevant tutors who have the relevant knowledge and skills to tutor that particular module. If you select tutors that are not relevant, you are going to experience some problems. After selection, I give them orientation in the course content so that they don't struggle. They don't find it difficult to support our student. I also provide guide, gu clear guidelines on how the content has to be uh, delivered, how they can break down the learning content into manageable sections, and how to design online activities for our students. Again, I have some markers. Markers also need support so that they do quality work. In this case, I organize meetings wherein we discuss the marking tools. For example, the memoranda and the rubrics for both marking of assignments and examination. I use a team approach, team-based approach in this regard. And using this approach assist in reducing some errors, increase quality, and ensures accuracy in the mark allocation. Markers are also encouraged to give constructive feedback to the students so that they develop themselves further uh, and prepare for examinations and also for the acquisition of knowledge. Markers are also encouraged and supported to attend online assessment training, which is our j -Ruta. All these are done to offer expanded range of student support as well as integrated <coughs> support to employees. My other portion is mentorship. Uh, as a mentor, I'm involved in the college wherein I have introduced a research forum. In this forum, this year, 12 young academics are participating and I support them in writing their research proposals. How to supervise the MND students and how to write for publications. Uh, this poster uh, is where one of the mentees showcase their work, what they've been doing in our mentoring meetings. As a supervisor, uh, I'm supporting the MND students in the field of educational technology or what you call e-learning. And my journey started in 2013 when I received a Vision Keeper Award. This award 
and hence me to select the one best mentor in the country who is based in the University of Cape Peninsula. So I went there and I learned some skills that he used to be successful. Uh, in that mentorship program, uh, I learned that in Siput, there are research support meetings which were held every Monday afternoon. So in that meetings, all the MNDs under his supervision, they assemble and then they make some presentation. There are critics going on and guidance on how to develop and shape your research. Then when coming back, I introduced the same uh, approach to our student in SEDU. Uh, though ours was uh, held on Thursdays afternoon from, eight, from four o'clock in the afternoon to eight in the evening. And it only benefited those students who are local because those who are far couldn't attend. And in that class, I had 10 students who participated from 2013 onwards. And today, uh, this class has established six masters and four doctoral students who have already completed their studies. And this support, I did it to motivate and inspire our students to become independent uh, scholars. In conclusion, uh, I would like to align myself with Brookfield who once said, teaching is about making some kind of dent in the world so that the world is different than it was before you practice your craft. Knowing clearly what kind of dent you want to make in the world means that you must continually ask yourself the most fundamental evaluative questions of all. The question reads, what effect am I having on students and on their learning? So with those few words, I'll say colleagues, let's support our student so to increase our throughput rates. Thank you. I want to thank Professor Ramarola um, very much. I think your whole um, uh, uh, mentorship and learning and passing on the mentorship you received to pass on um, within the department was absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and your passion for your students is, is, is clear. And I think you are making definite dents in the world. Um, thank you. Um, we got and I hope I get your name, your name right again. Our last speaker for this session is Ms. Nicole Jeremy Kay. That's correct. Um, she's a lecturer in musicology as a Mandela Rhodes Scholar in 2014 with funding from Rhodes University Prestigious Scholarship and South African Music Rights Organization. She pursued a master's degree in ethnomusicology focusing on songa hymn performance. Nicole's adapted her teaching style to suit tertiary online distance learning and has continued to develop her teaching philosophy in this context. She currently lectures modules in the sociology of music and music in society. And it's my pleasure to welcome her to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you here after lunch. I think uh, now that there are fewer people, my hands will shake a bit less. <laughs> So um, I certainly was inspired by the presentations from colleagues before, so thank you so much for those. And thank you for being here. I'll be sharing with you examples of the various ways in which I've supported my students. I hope that you will find these helpful to your own teaching. Student support emphasizes positive and supportive interactions with students. Students have written thanking me, not only for my support and academic guidance, but also for the novel ways in which I have presented material to them using multimedia. So due to the limited time, I will only briefly discuss two aspects of the award in student <coughs> support. The first aspect is about ensuring sustained, continuous and comprehensive support, and I will focus on comprehensive support. 
I realized that students need clarification on verbs with which we often start assignment and exam questions, such as discuss the following terms. I received an email from a student asking me to explain exactly what is meant by to discuss something. This prompted me to design an examination, <clears throat> excuse me, preparation document in which I explain these verbs and how to apply them in musicology. I adapted the list of verbs and the explanation on what, is, on what is expected of students according to the NQF levels. I made this document available to all students in a given module by uploading it onto my NISA additional resources. I have also incorporated some of these explanations into guidance for assignments uploaded onto my NISA 2. So when I look at the statistics section for each module, it is often the assignment guidance that students download the most. The approach in these exam and assignment preparation documents is important. Where appropriate, I incorporate answers to students' questions so that all students can benefit from these. I make it clear that uh, I make it clear that I answer students' questions in the document and thank the students for their questions as a way of encouraging, encouraging them to continue asking and so that they know their thoughts are acknowledged and appreciated. I also use bright colors to stimulate students' creative side. It is important to stimulate as many parts of the brain as possible when learning. A multi-sensory experience reinforces learning through visual and auditory modes. So here is an example of a document where I use bright colors. Each verb is italicized and in blue. All explanations are in orange. Application examples are in green and information for examinations are in pink. This color coding has a useful purpose for the visual learner. In ODEL, we need to use technology even in the simplest of ways to make our teaching as effective as possible. Time or lack of it is one of the major concerns for a student. By highlighting essential parts of the guidance in a coded way, Students can read and reread documents very quickly, and the color coding not only helps them to find the information or to jog their memory, but it stimulates their creative side. And in musicology, this is very important. So what about the auditory learner? A podcast consisting of a well-articulated summary of the module material is one solution. As many of you all know, a podcast is a sound recording on a topic. <coughs> It is good to make a, a podcast about 20 minutes in length so that it can be listened to in one sitting and so that the file size is not too large to be uploaded onto my NISA because this is a constraint. It should also be an accessible language with a friendly tone. So I did not only wish to provide color-coded documents and podcasts, but I wanted to create something as an all-in-one approach. So I tried to design something in, or I designed two things. So I, po I post the podcast onto my UNISA podcast section and accompany it with a PowerPoint slideshow. The aim is that students can listen and engage with the slideshow at the same time as listening to the podcast, thus catering for both the auditory and visual learner. Through engaging, through engaging the senses of hearing and sight. I also provide students with a document containing the written form of the podcasts, so if students wish, they can read and listen to the podcast at the same time. So here you'll see the podcast, PowerPoint presentation, and written out notes on my NISA. That was in the podcast section. Now in the additional resources section, the main part, you'll see circled right at the bottom there, that is an explanation of how to use these documents together. I provide, um, so I decided to make these documents separate for, for the following reasons. Students can choose how to engage with the resources to suit their own learning needs. I use easily accessible formats such as MP3 for the podcast and Microsoft PowerPoint for the slideshow. Also, some students might not readily have access to a laptop, so they can listen to the podcast on their cell phone, for example. The file sizes should also be kept as small as possible, so the separate documents help in this regard. 
In short, I wish to make my teaching as accessible as possible. I recall, um, as accessible uh, as possible in terms of content approach and in students being able to physically access the resources. So I'm going to play you an example of this. Now, just to keep in mind, in order to connect the podcast and the slideshow, I recorded the slide numbers into the podcast so that students would know exactly which slide to look at when. And you'll hear this in the following example. So um, Dr. Marie will help me with the, um, with the sound. And if we can please bring the slideshow back, uh, even once you've clicked the sound, that's fine. Okay, we're just having a problem with the sound. Do you have Windows Multimedia? Okay, okay, so um, I think what we can do, just to save time, perhaps let's just go back to the slideshow. Um, if you manage to get the sound going for the, the second example, that'd be great. Uh, but for now, let's just carry on with the slideshow. Yeah, from that side, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I will try and simulate a bit of the podcast here. Um, so basically, this is slide 14 of the, the slide PowerPoint presentation, and, sorry, uh, okay. So basically, this is self-animated, so when the student goes onto it, when they click onto it, all of these things, the arrows and even the explanations come onto the screen, and the podcast then explains. So as if you're standing in the lecture hall and you're explaining something and clicking. So it's, it's uh, autonomous in a sense. Okay. So many students wrote thanking me for this resource. And one student even said, because this module is not a parent learning module, this type of resource really helped her. This approach steers students away from rote learning and aims to involve as many of their senses as possible. All right, so that was comprehensive support. So another aspect um, I'm going to look at is the expanded range of student-specific support in terms of emotional, administrative, and discipline-specific support. And here I'll focus specifically on discipline-specific support. Focusing on this, I will show you the second of the educational tools I have designed. This one is called, I've called it a visual cast. The name is an amalgamation of a podcast referring to the sound and visual stimuli in the form of simple animated illustrations. Again, I've used Microsoft PowerPoint, which is easily accessible to students, and the file size is small enough to be uploaded on and downloaded from my UNISA. The aim of a visual cast is to provide a well-articulated summary of an important topic in a given module that includes fun illustrations and an enjoyable experience, lasting five minutes in duration. Ultimately, the aim is for it to be a memorable learning experience. So I'd like to show you the visual cast. If we... Okay, so we're just gonna open up the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so that is the final image there. And if we start the PowerPoint slide, what the student needs to do is click on the sound icon right at the top. And once they've clicked on that, then they click on the slide itself. And these images start coming up. Is the sound working? Sorry, I'm trying to get the technical guy. Okay, sure. Okay, looks like the sound isn't working yet. But let's, uh, let's carry on and hopefully the sound will come. So basically, um, this is kind of like a podcast that is inserted into this slide. Um, the reason why I've made it in the PowerPoint slideshow is because, of course, it's easily accessible and I've made it into one slide. Now this is done to keep the, the, the document as small as possible, but also so that by the end of the visual cast, the student can have a nice summary in one go. So that's the aim. Now what you see in the middle there um, 
It says analysis. Now, that is the central point, the central topic that is being discussed. This visual cast was modeled on an article in the e-reserves that students had to read and understand. They had to incorporate it into a question. So I thought this would be a really great way to help them really understand and get to grips with the article. So at the, at the very center of the article is this analysis. And as you might have seen right at the beginning, it started with that circle, a man inside walking up the stairs and out. There was a problem. Noting the problem, now there's a man with binoculars looking at analysis. That is so students can see right throughout this visual cast that this is what we're focusing on. Just a very simple visual illustration of, of what you need to focus on. Now, you can see the images coming up. They follow a, a kind of circular motion around this one slide. You'll see them come as we go. Now, the idea with this is very simply a design principle where you read from left to right. It flows well with the eye. So it's, yeah, just in terms of design. So I'm going to speak a bit more about design now. Aesthetic program. Oh, thank you. There's our sound. analysis could or should be. Let's listen to the sound a bit. I think it's at the right point. In deep thought, Agawu wrote at his desk and came up with a few ideas. Analysis involves structural hearing. The cues come from inside the work, not outside of it. Analysis entails systematic investigation. He thought a great deal about Theodore Adorno's idea that analysis is the only means of finding the truth content of a work. He also realized that in analysis, it is easy to become distracted by the investigation of compositional processes or of describing the work, or even trying to figure out whether musical relationships discovered through analysis were indeed the composer's intention. Unlike Kerman, Agawa thought that we need more than just a rejection of analysis, that there was much more in analysis. A light bulb moment came. Agawa realized that we need to find creative, musical ways to remain in, with, or under analysis. So he detailed that analysis is like performance. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. Firstly, we can stop it is there. Not and if you can exit the slideshow so we can see the full, the full image. Okay, thank you. Great, so you have a bit of an idea of what it entails towards the end there. Now, if you have a look, um, okay, let's, let's start with where we entered with the sound. Agao sits at his desk in deep thought. This is something I added to make it a bit of a story, um, a sequence of events that students can easily remember. So very simply that, you'll see in the green box, there are terms there. In the podcast, I specifically did not mention the terms, but I described them, and the terms are, are to be read. So that's just bringing the visual and the auditory together. Now, finally, my last point about this is that the whole diagram comes back to the center. If you see, we now have performance and composition in the circle, and um, a little man jumping for joy there. This is Agawa reaching his solution. So before we had the problem, and now we've reached the solution, and the other figures, the guy with the binoculars, will all disappear by the end of it. If you see the use of colors, it's been used strategically. Performance and composition in the bottom right-hand corner, those are purple. And if you see, they are linked to the middle under analysis, showing visually that they are connected. Very simply like that. Okay, so that's, that's the visual cast. Um, so I've presented some ODEL resources I've created for comprehensive and discipline-specific support using a diverse array of teaching materials and approaches. Um, I've endeavored to support my students in critical areas of their learning. 
I hope that these ideas I've shared will inspire <clears throat> us to continue to be creative in our teaching, and I'd be very interested to hear students' reactions to this and colleagues. Thank you so much. I can invite all the last uh, um, presenters from the last session to come and join us on the stage. Uh, Professor Ramarola, <coughs> uh, Ms. Delise van Heerden, um, two Neils, uh, um, and Lee Stone. I think that's, have I got everyone? And I just thank you to um, Nicole. I enjoy the creativity. I am, cannot draw anything. Oh, you want to hear short? Um. <laughs> one of you can, the, the Neils can share one. <laughs> but, um, um, so so, so um, just to Nicole, um, your creativity is lovely. I can't draw to save my life, and I'm always jealous when I see something like that. Um, and thank you for the innovation. I thought it was really nice. Um, right, we've now got to question and response time. Um, and um, if there are students who want to, they get first choice of the cherry in asking questions or making comments. Are there any students here who want to make some comments? Okay, can I open the floor up to anyone else? I'm sure, um, yes. Um, the two of you, can you just say your name? I don't know, is there a microphone somewhere? Come in. It's coming. Okay, so just, so Ted would like to know from each of you your, what your students' group structure was if you didn't mention it during your, your talk. The level you're there at and how many you're actually, um, yeah. So that's the first one, Elna. Um, I'm Elna yes. from Maggie's College. That's why I know your name. <laughs> the, um, Nicole, I loved what you did. It's really fantastic and I know the students will love it. Just one comment, and, and I heard, this was told to me by the disability office, be careful of red and green. I had students that said to me, every time you do something important and I put it in red, they can't see it. So be careful of that. Just a comment. Yes, I, I hear the, um, the English rugby players have put a red thread in the rugby shirt so they become invisible to the opposition. Um, <laughs> and I'm being serious. Um, I'm just worried they'll become invisible to each other as well. Um, <laughs> But yes, <laughs> too much information. Um, is there any other, can we start with those? Um, if we start from left to right, the needles will go and then go across. Do you have a mic? No. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, just briefly, as I mentioned in the presentation, we are, well, it's a second year module and we have roughly a thousand students per semester. I hope that answers your question. Okay, I stated all my... Uh, the, the module that I used is a semester rice module and then we have 3,000 students per semester. Uh, it's it's a B at module. It's se it's second year. Did, I think I did give you mine. Do you want to hear them again? Uh, second year module with it ranges between about two and a half to three and a half thousand per semester. So the. Things I spoke about uh, for second and third year modules, uh, typically 10 to 15 students in a module. <coughs> Thanks. Ted, do you have a follow up question? No. Okay. So I think also it depends what you can do with the number of students you have. Are there any other questions, queries, comments? Um, can I just make a last one? Um, a comment. There's. Um, what I picked up during this whole session is thoughtfulness and mindfulness. Um, and I think both of those are fundamental to what you've all been doing. Um, 
And I really want to, to, to thank you for sharing that because um, it's, I think it's made us thoughtful and mindful as well. Um, and, the second, and, and the second one is generosity of time. Um, and I think that comes with the passion to be, have, be um, kind enough to share your time with your students um, because it does take, take time. Um, and the third one is a statement which I would like to sort of like close with in that what I think I've learned in this whole session is that we need to care about the student and we need to care about the student we deliver. And they are two different things and they're just as important. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and so now I'm going to hand over to the last session. Um, and thank you everyone for your attendance. And thank you.